When you're hiring, it feels amazing to finally close out a job search. But what if you could get rid of the search and just match? You can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome to Pod Maverick After Dark. My name is Kirk Henderson. I am editor in chief over at MavsMoneyBall.com. I'm joined by fellow editor Josh Bow. We've not seen each other in several days. How you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? We're okay. I'm okay here. So that was, uh, you know, it's kind of an odd period of days off. The Mavericks lost to the yeah. Lakers. Pretty ugly road game. Um, last was that Wednesday or Thursday? That was a Wednesday. So it's been a while. They were scheduled to play the Warriors Friday, and then they were going to have two games off or two days off to, to, until they played the Celtics. And instead, what ended up happening is due to the really um, sad circumstance of the uh, Golden State Warriors assistant coach passing away, and then the Warriors like getting stranded in Utah. Um, the league postponed that game, which we will have um, at a later date. Uh, so you know, we the Mavericks had a five whopping days, a rarity. Uh, at this point in the regular season to kind of figure out what's been plaguing them. Uh, and then they had quite the challenge on the horizon against the Boston Celtics and they lost <laughs> 119 to 110. So hmm, don't really know where to start with this one. Um, the Celtics were playing four games and six nights. They're on the second night of a back-to-back. The Mavericks now fall to one in four against teams that uh, are playing on the second night of a back-to-back. This one sort of, I, I think it's a little bit of a pass compared to the others because the Celtics are simply a much deeper and better team. But that stat as a whole is an indictment of the coaching staff and their inability to prepare the players. And we've sort of shied away from bitching too much about coaching because I keep talking about how um, it doesn't matter relative to Luca and Kyrie being mad at kid. But at a certain point, it's like, come on guys like you got to have a better game plan against the celtics than let them shoot corner threes <laughs> yeah the celtics shot 15 corner threes they only made five of them um which it was just a weird it was a weird game we could just say that it was a weird game the celtics didn't shoot very well um they shot really well from mid-range but they've got good you know they've got good jump shooters they were only 11 of 20 at the rim um and the mavericks were 18 of 30 like a lot of smoked layups in this game like shots to uh shots to everyone everyone Um, everyone missed an open the ones that i'm really mad at are josh green because i just am i'm i'm just against josh green he's kind of it's kind of my religion but um it was really rough yeah it was really rough um i thought they started the game fairly well i mean boston shot one of 10 from three in the first quarter 
I, you know, I think the Mavericks had the right disposition to start the game for the most part. Um, and they did play a little bit faster and that's what you want to do against a team with tired legs. Mm -hmm. They did win, uh, the fast break points, uh, but barely, they probably should have won that by a little bit more considering how many missed threes Boston had. Boston was 15 to 46 from three. That's a, you know, that's 32%. That's not like horrific. It's not good. Um, but that's a lot of misses for, you know, uh, you know, only making 15 out of 46, they really should have been able to maybe push the tempo a little bit more because we literally just saw the Mavericks have a bad three-point shooting night and the Lakers basically take all their three-point misses and run it right down their throat. And they had like 26 fast break points. So for the Mavericks, only have 18. Like, that's okay, but they probably should have done a little bit better job. It felt like as the game wore on, they did not run uh, nearly as much. And they didn't turn over a lot. They only had 10 turnovers, so it's not like they were sloppy with the ball. Um, I just thought they tried to do a little bit too much ground and pound, you know, and that probably starts with the first thing we need to talk about, which is Luca. And I, you know, I know what the numbers say. I'm looking right at him. I know he had a 33 point, 18 rebound, 13 assist, triple double. Worst triple double you might ever <laughs> see from him. This was a bad Luca game. Like this, I would, I would not call this a great Luca game. I thought he did, started off a little weird. I think he didn't get some calls that, you know, right or wrong. He, you know, he just didn't get them. It affected um, his game yeah, for at least he, a quarter. He kind of yeah, got he, it back, but it, it, he was out. He of got it back, but you know, you can't, you can't throw away that many minutes against a team this good. Even if they're missing Porzingis, even if they're missing, even if they're on the second half of back to back, by the time he got, you know, really engaged into the game, you know, they're down 16 in the second half. And like, you basically have to pitch a perfect game uh, to win the game that point and and they weren't they you know they just they couldn't do that because not a lot of teams can do that um so like i just thought i you know i thought defensively his effort level was not great in the first half i thought it got a little better as the game were on obviously he has the low light of the jalen brown you know breaking ankles mid-range jumper which did not look great Put that on the jumbo trauma and tim hardaway lost his mind i know which i i Kind of, I kind of get it. I get it too. I'm just like, well, who are you losing your mind at? Because isn't the jumbotron person probably not in the front row? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I got, I'm getting a lot of people telling me that Luca didn't play bad defense tonight. Uh, that Brown just made jumpers, and what are you going to do about it? And I get that to a degree, but Brown was kind of able to dictate the terms of where he wanted to go on the court. I don't necessarily think he didn't get to the rim a ton because he was getting stonewalled the no. whole game. Like Brown likes to shoot mid range jumpers. Yep. Um, and he I, I own him and uh, he's on my fantasy team. He's yeah. uh, he's been a delight to watch because he's, he's like trimmed up all the garbage from his game. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you want to tuck yourself in at night and be like, well, he just made a bunch of difficult shots and Luca was fine. I don't know. I mean, there was a reason the Celtics basically abandoned their offense to run it through Brown against Luca continuously. Yes. And like, I think the that's... Celtics don't do that no. if they don't feel like they have an advantage there. Well, and then there's there's the the point that was raised in our Slack where it's like someone was like, why is kid on Brown? Well, because you go through the rest of the roster with the way that they were playing tonight, yeah. Luca was either on Horford at points or he was on Brown. And you can't move him on to Drew or to someone else because that means Tim Hardaway or somebody of that ilk, like Grant Williams, is is on Brown. And we'll get to those guys. Yeah, I this, we'll talk about them. But yeah. in all honesty, like, Luca's size is your best option. And, and you know, Brown played a great game. Luca could afford to play better defense tonight, but that wasn't the difference. I mean, there might have been at spots, but yeah. it's like you get yeah. frustrated with Luca's defense every game. But it's like like he – And it wasn't just the ISO defense, like the mm -hmm. transition defense early. Like, you know, he, he had a couple of bad possessions complaining to the refs. I remember there was one early Drew Holiday missed a wide open corner three because, you know, Luca was just pissed off and didn't want to cross yep. half court. Yep. And they could have gotten killed a bit more in the first half. You know, I mean, the Celtics scored 41 points in the second quarter. Yep. They were so cold to start the game. If they played a normal game in the first quarter, I mean, this is not a nine point loss with the way, you know, your stars came out to start the game. This is, we're talking about a 20, 25 point loss potentially mm -hmm. because like Luke and Kyrie had to be better and they weren't, you know, Luca yep. was shot under 50% from the floor. He shot two of eight from three. Kyrie was nine of 20 from the floor. Didn't look particularly 
uh, a, a great, you know, he had some moments. I think he had a couple moments in the fourth where he thought, okay, he's going to turn it on. But he yeah, kinda... he had a nice, he had a nice close to the third quarter, I think, yeah. which might have gave Dallas a little bit of air. And you know, the Kyrie discussion, as always, is very frustrating because I think that you know you, you get his 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 largest supporters who are like, oh, he can't get in rhythm if he's not shooting the ball. I mean, I'm not aware of anybody telling Kyrie not to shoot the ball. He just doesn't force it. And he was getting opportunities that towards the end of the third, he had two 10-footers where he drove with the purpose and gets kind of right below the free throw line, plants hard and rises and fires. And statistically speaking, that's a, a shot defenses are happy to give up. You know, I, I'm glad I want Kyrie to take more of them, but it's like this is just one of these situations where if Kyrie's not going to shoot, catch, catch and shoot threes, I don't Dallas doesn't run enough offense they don't run enough plays so you're you're either relying on Kyrie being a one-on-one wizard or you're getting looking for some you know he's playing out of a pick and roll in certain situations and against Boston's length unless Luca's kicking the crap out of them Kyrie wasn't going to be very effective unless he was taking a lot of three-pointers and he and he didn't do that tonight that's okay yeah and I mean hey Derek White, Drew Holiday backcourt also quite not, the backcourt. <laughs> not fun to go against. Um, mm-hmm. It just feels a little worse because he also had a stinker against the Lakers. He only had 12 points on 16 shots. Um, so he's had two, you know, it's not great timing. He's had two, his two worst games of the month um, coincide with the two games Lucas come back after missing, you know, like the following, games. following, you know, quite you know, candidly, this is not hyperbole. Yeah. That five game stretch, uh, our friend Istok Franco had a Twitter had a Twitter thread about this. That five game stretch was possibly Kyrie's best five game stretch statistically in his career, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is crazy to say for a man that talented with the, with those kind of accolades. But it 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 hangs on you and it, and it frustrates you. And I don't necessarily think it's one of those things that gives the the people that don't think they can play together excuses, yeah. but. This wasn't that. The the Celtics are the best team in the league. I don't want to do – Nick Angstad of, of Locked on Mavs made a lot of Twitter mad when he's like, what? Like, the Celtics are a better team. And I – Yeah, people I, are mad I, about this I, I agree. Like, I'm yeah. – I'm, I don't want to downplay anybody's feelings. I'm just like – my frustration came from how the Mavericks looked. Not so much – how um the result of the game where it's like okay they lost but if they would have lost by four points or you know I, I asked you to talk about something they lost by nine points tonight but why don't you why don't you discuss that one stat that you had pulled out before this game do you remember it yeah so um they had 12 losses last season by with 10 or more points um and that was something we talked about a lot how it was weird that this this 38 win team just does not get blown out. It was At they, all. Made, they made so many three pointers. They just made every game close regardless of, of their effort level. And this season they have, uh, they have 13, they have 13 losses already this season with uh, 10 or by 10 or more points, almost got their 14th tonight, but it's nine. So that doesn't count, but they still have 13. So they already have one more than they did last season. And we've still got, you know, almost a half season left of games to go. Um, and I just thought that was interesting, like, because usually, and this team is still making a lot of three pointers. It's not that their three pointers, uh, have really fallen off compared to last season. Um, so I don't know, I, you know, when I tweeted it, I didn't really know what to make of it. Like, you know, is this, is this a, a sign of something you mentioned in Slack that there's more blowouts league wide this season, yes. so they might be caught up in that trend, but they're losing, you know, they're getting, they're they're losing games more easily, I guess you should say, compared to last season. And last yeah. season they were a 38 win team. Now you want to flip the other side of the coin, the glass half uh full, is they had 15 wins all of last season against teams below 500. They're 14 and four against below 500 teams this season. So I don't know what it means for this season, but it might be um I don't know. Maybe last season was just really, maybe it just means last season was just super weird. Um, Cause you know, you're supposed to beat the bad teams with, you know, a team like the Mavericks, you want to be in that range, the playoff range that they're aiming for. You got to beat the bad teams and do your best against the good ones. But if you beat the bad teams, you'll probably be in the playoffs and they're still doing that. Um, but I don't know. Like, you know, people are mad and like this game didn't tell me anything. I didn't already know. No, 
No, the Mavericks I, are not as good as the Celtics. You know, are, are people pissed off because they're not as good as the Celtics without their second well, you, best player and on the second night of back to back? I don't know. I guess you know, my man. Not. Where 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 is it at? So so my man Brian, who comes on the live show, um, I might host one tonight just because I I stupidly drank a bunch of caffeine at like eight thirty. Uh, so I think I might be awake and host one tonight. He he shared with stats that the Mavs are now 16 and 17 since an eight and two start to the season. 500 basketball after an eight and two start to the season. That's what you're telling me. Um, I mentioned this last game or last time we talked, like if the Mavericks finish 44 and 38, that's a six game improvement. It's pretty good. Success. <laughs> It's pretty good. It's not what people want. You want mm-hmm. to see connected basketball. You want to see some sense of growth and going somewhere. And that 21-22 season, that second half of the year where the Mavericks essentially played, like they won something like 70% of their games after Tim Hardaway went down. I'm pretty sure of that. And I could be wrong, but Tim Hardaway went down against the Golden State Warriors at the end of January. That pulled him out of the lineup. And so the Mavericks had seven and a half guys and they rolled deep. They played a scrambling defense. They shocked the shit out of everyone. They also did this thing because this just happens in March and April. Teams start to tank. So you just, you start beating teams if you're trying to make the playoffs and and the schedule pans out that way. And I think that's given our fan base a little bit of a misconstrued notion of what a non-contender does in the regular season. You try to build stretches. You try to have things where, where teams uh, are, are building towards something and are fixing their weaknesses. You know, the, Brad Townsend shared this really interesting stat that the Mavericks have made a deal at the postseason for seven straight years. I didn't even realize that, and we run a Mavericks website together. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, that might happen again this year, but most what does that tell you is that most of these moves are inconsequential. Like, they don't move the needle for a team. Like, who did the Mavericks trade for somebody in 21 22? I don't remember. Did it matter? Like I, I, I'm just, and I bring all this up to say like where we are as a team is very frustrating because we're like right in the doldrums. Of 21, the 20, 21, 22, by the way, was when they traded KP. They traded KP away. Yeah, that's right. In, so they sent him away. Dinwiddie. Yeah. And so it was, it was essentially subtraction. They got Spencer Dinwiddie. That was the, you know, then that, then that, that was, was, that was when things started to roll. Um, I, I was wrong about, uh, no, Tim did get hurt then because he wasn't part of the conference finals teams he was just we kept thinking he yeah was tim come did back. Get hurt. Yep, tim um did. so yeah that was why the mavericks were rolling rolling so, so it's just like you know is it is it possible that the mavericks figure something out and go on a hell of a win streak i mean yes i just i just don't don't think so so but that's also okay <laughs> like, what for me when i like when i i live game to game and get just as mad as you guys during the games trust me my my twitter feed reflects that that's why like skin wade hated me for several years because he thought i was just a lunatic i'm like no i'm just the drunk at the sports bar um but this is one of these things where you get fans like you can't waste a year of luca don't disagree sure, for sure <laughs> but rome wasn't built in a day god i'm sorry this is a fantastic comment we're gonna circle get grant williams some help uh we're gonna circle back to grant williams here after we take a short break so just want to let you guys know though um Really appreciate everybody who is listening on our Apple podcast feed because of this weekend, after six weeks of fuckery, we got that baby fixed, which means most of our listeners are actually listening to this pod again. Thank God. Josh and I have been podcasting a little bit into the void. Um, If you could leave us a review on whichever podcast service you listen to, I would be incredibly grateful or just leave a star rating. That sort of stuff really helps us. Josh and I have taken a beating these last two years. First, moving away from SB Nation. you know, they opted to let us go. They replaced uh, like 40 podcasts with the Andre Igudala podcast. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to be mad at them. Um, and then we just had this screwy issue with our RSS feed that it took uh, the tech guys forever to get a hold of. And now we're back in back in line. While you're here, uh, if you're here listening to the YouTube uh, live show, I'd appreciate it if you go and give us a like and consider giving us a subscription. We go uh, live after every show, or I'm sorry, after every game one way, shape, or form, or another. Sometimes we even do two shows where you can join and talk and yell at me if you think I'm wrong. Uh, We're just a couple of guys talking a little bit of hoops. All right, thanks for uh, letting me shill. And if you'd also listen to these ads on the podcast feed, I'd very much appreciate it. All right, Josh, what should we talk about next? Because I just ended that last segment with like a 90-second soliloquy. I didn't mean to, but I was kind of all over the map. No, that's okay. Um, Before we get into some deeper 
the Maverick stuff with this game because there's definitely some lineup stuff we could talk about and there's mm. some more players we need to talk about. I just wanted to touch on the Celtics because this is really, you know, I try to watch non-Mavericks games as much as I can, but it's it's really difficult when this is our second job, basically. And, you know, we work full-time during the day. Um, we both have families and, and young children, you know. You, right. I do my best. and But I what I do is I, I just consume from all the smart people that are watching a lot of these games to help keep me, you know, know what's going on around the league. But I can't always watch national TV games or league pass or what have you. So this was really my first – one of my first up close look looks at the Celtics, like really getting to watch, not just watching highlights or watching a half, uh, you know, while out to dinner or something like that. Yeah. Um, and what I took away was two things. One, they're really good, which is duh. They're, they're, <laughs> they're really good. Um, but they're also interesting in that, you know, something I've heard from a lot of smart people, particularly the Zach Lowe beats this drum a lot is, you know, he's always like, you know, I wish the Celtics, you know, instead of just making that automatic kick out for a three, I wish they would just go to the rim more. Mm -hmm. And, like, they just, they don't go to the rim. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just, for a team as athletic and as talented as they are, and for as many guys that are as capable with the ball in their hands, like White and Holiday and Brown and Tatum, uh, and even Porzingis, like, when he's healthy, like, the fact that they are not one of the top rim teams in the league is kind of surprising. And I get that they have to take a lot of threes because they've got so many good three point shooters, but I totally saw it in this game where I was like, what the only reason it was a 26, 24 game after the first quarter, like the whole, you know, they went one of 10 from three and they should have been down a bunch, but they just went to the basket almost mm-hmm. every play. And they were getting what they wanted because, you know, let's be real with the Mavericks, you know, without Exum, when you're having to play Luca Kyrie, um, and Tim Hardaway Jr., you know, a lot of a lot of minutes, and you don't have Exum, and you've got this compromised version of Grant Williams. They just don't have a lot of perimeter defense. You know, it's basically Derek Jones on an island a lot of the time, and then hope Derek Lively or Maxi can clean it up. So I was like, you know, they should keep doing that. And they kind of stopped. I mean, they started making threes in the second quarter, but the second half, like they just don't force the issue a lot. Um like there's a way you can shoot a lot of threes and still, you know, attack the paint fairly well. Um, mm-hmm. And I was just, I just thought that stood out. And I wonder if that's going to be like their Achilles heel in the postseason. is, are they going to have a, a shooting slump for like a game or two? Uh, and they just don't compensate it by getting to the basket. So I thought that was interesting. I thought that was, you know, I was watching the game and like, I almost felt like I was like coaching the Celtics. I was like, wait, why are you stopping at the free throw line? Right. You had a step or or why are you passing it up up at the rim? You had a layup or a foul. Uh, I just thought that was interesting. We're not a Celtics podcast, so I no, know. no. It's uh, just... I thought that was interesting. And then, um, like I said, they're just really good, and I think that their defensive versatility is really impressive. Um, and I don't know, just they're. I, I thought this was a difficult game for the Mavericks, even considering the circumstances. Just with like White um, and Holiday, like. Uh, you know, those guys did not shoot the ball very well. Holiday did, but J- Derek White was 2 of 12 from the floor. But, man, like, he made some plays. Like, yep. Those are two good players. So, th- that's my little – You did like a little forced, sol- soliloquy. He, There's my Celtics soliloquy. He forced, he forced a Kyrie turnover as Kyrie was taking the ball up the court on the right side of the court. He just pestered <laughs> him enough. Like, Kyrie Irving, one of the best ball handlers. His only of, turnover of the, of the game. game. Multiple generations. Like, that's yeah. what Ky- – and so it's it's really something. Um, this is funny. When Kyrie played with LeBron, they ran Kyrie with Ali Hoop, DeBron, the whole game with Luka. The Mavs play slow, and Kyrie is in the corner. Does not look right. If you think Kyrie Irving stands in the corner, you're not watching the game. He stands at the wing. <laughs> um, I just I'm just sassing people. I love people that join this this whole thing. So with with you know. This the recipe for this game was that Luca was going to be cooking, and then Kyrie would feast on the fact that they would have to over adapt to Luca. They never Didn't had to. Yeah, they never had to. Um, the one change that happened in the second half that I just don't fucking understand, <laughs> that I just don't understand, is why do we care that Maxi Kleba? Like, what? What is that? 
He played 25 minutes <laughs> along with Derek Lively playing 25 minutes. He played nine minutes in the second half. Lively did, right? Lively did, yeah. yeah. And yeah, he that... did anything wrong. Like, <sighs> what? Maxi is, is, it is 2024. Maxi is a nice bit player for 12 minutes a game or, or you play him as a stretch four with Lively. You stop playing him as a stretch five. I don't care how good his defense is. He is a non-contributing zero on offense, and his, his box score is a lie, okay? His, he is three of seven from the field with seven points and two rebounds. He had nothing the whole game. Luka forced him to take shots at the rim when the Mavericks were already going to lose. I'm pretty sure he had five points in the final two minutes of the game. I think he had all seven of his points in the final two minutes of the game. If if Derek Lively is our is the future, if he can't shoot right now, I at least want to see him try. One of the things that had him shoot up draft boards was not just his defensive awareness, it was his ability to shoot in workouts. It became a little bit of a legend. I would rather play the guy who is not terrified to shoot than the guy who is supposed to be your stretch five and doesn't do anything. Teams don't care up until, so tonight he took seven shots prior to tonight's game. In the previous five games, he had taken 11 total shots through five games. That's a scouting report thing, guys. That goes in the scouting report. You see it. You might not remember it, but oh, if Maxi Kleba gets the ball, you don't care because he's not shooting it. Just let him take it. We'll live and die by Maxi shooting threes. That's fine. If Maxi Kleba beats us, we're fine with that. That's a coaching that's just that's right there. I can tell you that exists on these on these short uh, um, scouting reports, and I just I don't understand the only offense the only offense that was alive for the Mavericks were Luca Lively pick and rolls were Kyrie Lively pick and rolls. Enough of this Maxi crap. I just I don't want to see it. It's been six games already. I've joked. I was like I want Maxi back so I can I can I can be mad about Maxi. No more Maxi. No. <laughs> So Not only, that much, at least. Yeah, I think the I think two things happened. Uh, well, they kind of go they kind of coincide. I think the coaching staff rode the in game plus minus a little too hard. Uh, Maxi finished minus one. Lively was minus seven. And as we both said, those can be very deceiving. Uh, in game plus minus can be very deceiving, and I just wonder if the coaching staff was looking at that kind of stuff at halftime and just overcorrected. And to be fair, you know. That's not just a kid thing. Rick Carlisle overreacted to in-game plus minus all the time. All the time he did that. Um, so that's a certain thing. That's a certain that's a quirk with coaches. They just they they look at they look at the box score at halftime, they see that number, and, and then they make adjustments. Um, so that's part of it. Another is the Celtics do play five out, um, yeah. which means lively has to close out and be away from the rim. And that wasn't always working in the second quarter when the Celtics made a bunch of threes, they score 41 points. I think my counter to that is I don't don't necessarily disagree with that line of thinking like hey let's let Maxi be the one who can close out because he's much more comfortable and I think he did a little bit of a better job the Celtics didn't make as many threes in the second half but I the balance was just out of whack like I don't think that necessarily means Lively has to be sent to the phantom zone for most of the second half you know they, they could have found a way to better balance it because Maxi was on the floor for long stretches where they were getting some stops, but they were not scoring making headway. Yeah. Because he, you know, and, and lively had six points. Um, I know Maxi technically had more points, but you know, Maxi, all Maxi's points basically came in. Lively had three gorgeous finishes. Yeah. He and caught he eight, one. He had, yeah, go ahead. He caught one oop up high, but the ball was deflected just so, so he catches it, brings it down, but does not bring the ball to his waist. He keeps it near his head and using his big seven foot frame, jumps up and dunks it. A couple plays later, he guides another tipped pass. Actually, I think um, Drew Holiday might have bumped him on the jump, which is like one of those fouls they simply never call. He he, and if uh, Drew hadn't have bumped him on the on the roll. Uh, Lively would have jammed it, but instead Lively catches it and kisses it off the glass. And then he had one more finish that made me just be like, oh my God. He was really like, good on the boards too. 
I get and, two rebounds. And like, so you're you're hearing me. Um, one of my friends, Kenny, kind of goaded me on the on the Twitter about how Dwight Powell is like an elite role man. And I just, as a former big man who sucked ass at rolling, I get sort of offended when people are like, "Rolling's an easy skill." It's not. No, it's not. Jesus Christ, Lively is so good at it. And or we, really, Collie Stein would still be in the league. Like <laughs> Stein, Javale McGee, all these. Yeah. Ass- Clown players the Mavericks had as center for several years. Went through the list like Moses Brown. Uh, yeah, if it was so easy, then why haven't those guys learned it? Christian but, Wood was pretty good at it. Um, yeah, he was. KP good. couldn't do it. Still, because I mean, but that's he was pick and a, pop. He could, yeah. but now he's doing. He's doing it now. He's doing no, everything now. Yeah, he looks better now. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, Lively also had four offensive rebounds. Um, mm-hmm. Mavericks actually won the battle on the boards, forty-eight to forty-four, which is not something they do. And I thought, like, he was getting a hand. Like, when he was on the floor, the Celtics could not close possessions very well, even when the Mavericks missed a shot. Like, even though he only had he had four offensive rebounds, but he probably altered or tipped a few more and made some a little bit more difficult. He only had two fouls. Like, I, I'm not, again, I understand the, the coaching strategy and the Celtics are playing five out. Let's get Maxi in there to close out the shooters. But I just think they could have worked that balance a little bit better um and lively i just would have liked to see more live like maybe instead of it them being equal like could it have been lively 30 maxi 20 just, just something a little bit i just don't think lively played poorly enough with the stretch fives with the with the five out ball ball to, to just get mothballed as much as he did in the second half that's all yep we're going to circle back to some of the kid quotes at the end. Uh, Kyrie apparently sprained his thumb. That's something that we discovered in post game. He says he's going to play through it. That is what it is. Um, what just to kind of finish up, like talking about the specifics of the game. Like I just, we're going to talk about him again. Cause we have to Grant Williams gave this pregame interview where he's had a couple like, cause he talked, in practice yesterday and Brad Townsend mm-hmm. wrote a piece about it. And then he did this pregame. Like he's on a little bit of a media tour. He's on a media <laughs> tour. Cause he's just so friendly and he talks a lot. And, and I don't know, like <laughs> he needs to keep what he needs. It, and you know, he needs to stop until his play improves because he sounds like a failing politician on the campaign trail with all the things he's saying, because he's playing horrendous basketball yeah i think we can just kind of leave it at that two points um he had one nice pass to the corner that was kind of cool but uh for most of the game he was a a pretty strong negative um i I just i I feel bad for the guy uh and i i yeah i I don't know what to say i don't know what to say say. like this is he is uh, he is quickly turned into one of the Mavericks I've liked least during my time as a Mavericks fan, and that goes back to 1999. Um, so and he really continue, continues the stretch of their biggest offseason acquisition, uh, just being really bad. Right. Oh yeah, and that's like, just a that's welcome a Maverick. to the Delon Wright Josh Richardson club of just <laughs> just guys who come that are apparently good that when they play with the Mavericks then die. Yeah, just. Don't don't get it. Um, yeah, that's. Yeah, I don't. And I, I, here's a question I have for you. So Ooh. the Mavericks played, basically played an eight man rotation. Jaden Hardy was the ninth man, but he played two minutes. Doesn't matter. Um, I'm looking at the bench. The bench was Maxi Grant and Tim Hardaway Jr. Okay. Dante Exum's going to come back and he's going to start. So he's going to start for Josh Green. So that means Green's going to come off the bench. Okay. Um, is Grant Williams going to be in the rotation when Dante Exum's healthy? No, no, and that's okay. 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 That's okay. okay. Um, I don't want to see him anymore. But, like, okay, I, I you really don't, don't. But do you, do you think he will be out of the rotation when Exum? I mean, I think they should try to trade him for anything as quickly okay. as possible. Okay, he is almost unrecoverably bad. It's so funny because I've been talking with Golden State Warrior friends of mine who were like, "Let's." I really hope the Ma- the Mavericks want Wiggins and like Wiggins. <laughs> it's like the only guy who might be playing worse than Grant Williams. Yeah, he might be. <sighs> okay, um, so so you really okay? I can we talk about Josh more. Green? Yeah, we can like, talk about Josh Green. Had, uh, one of my friends, Ashan, uh, said to me, "He's like my optimistic take on this Mavericks game is is that Josh Green played well." Um, what the Celtics decided to do was put Al Horford on him. Al Horford is my age, and they didn't care what Josh Green did. 
Josh Green shot the ball well. I, I want him to keep shooting. His shot, like the annual, uh, the the second annual elbow sprain, has really helped his shot. Like, his, <laughs> so at least there's that. Pretty pleased about that. Um, now let me read you. I'm going to read you a pair of quotes. Kind of okay. Uh, where did it go? I have too many tabs open. So uh, for those of you who don't know, um, the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves lost to the Charlotte Hornets. Yeah, they lost to the Hornets tonight. Uh, but Carl Anthony Towns scored 62 points. <laughs> he had 44 at the half, the most than a half, I think, ever. Uh, maybe in record. It's been, it, no, since like play-by-play basketball, like since live television. It's been it's incredible. 44 points, just a gajillion. Coach Chris Finch, after the game. It was an absolute disgusting performance of defense and immature basketball all the way through the game. This is what happens when you have this type of approach. What a quote. Now, I'm going to read to you one from head Dallas Mavericks head coach, Jason Kidd. Just a little side-by-side for this one. I think we were just a little bit frustrated with the officiating and we lost our focus. We've got to be better. I mean, he's not wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a, it's a, one of the things um, that I think is interesting where it's just like when I, I settle on this, I get so mad when I read these kid quotes because I think as, as you know, a manager in my day job and, you know, managing guys, Mavs Moneyball, you, you can't throw your team under the bus. However, it has been explained to me and I tend to understand um, that – a coach has certain motivational bullets in his chamber to use every year. And when kid goes at the team, like he does in some of these games, he does so because he knows he only has so many times to be passive aggressive before he loses them. He doesn't do it that often. I think it tonight's not the game for kid to go off on the team. No, he usually saves it for a bad defensive game because that's what pisses him off the most. What? I, I just, I just don't, you know, I wanted to circle back on kid because like the lively of it all really frustrated me. But at the same time, like this was, this is not kids finest performance. It's also not like the Mavericks are still get five games over 500. Like the, the, it's just, he's not wrong. Kid is not wrong when he's, he basically implies like these guys are professionals. It's their job to get out and execute. I just think we would like to see, you know, a lot of us were like raised on firebrand coaches. And we want to see that. And I think in hindsight, Rick Carlisle wasn't even that much of a firebrand coach because he just like you lose players that way. You just do. The season's too long. And so I'm not like back here necessarily. I've kind of needed to talk myself through this in the podcast because <laughs> I'm going to be too crazy about Kid again. I, I wish he would do some stuff differently, but it's like what? I wish he would take a technical every now and then. Ev, that's that's about all. Yeah, because like Luca, Luca was getting the shit beat out of him in that in that first half. Like that Grant Williams foul at the half that wasn't called. Like that was a foul. He got broadsided. Like, granted, I don't believe Grant Williams would have made the free throws, so it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> it's just it's it's one of these things where we keep coming back to it, and like things are really going to have to go sideways, and I don't want them to go sideways. So I don't know. Yeah, and I think the only thing tactical, like besides the lively tactically, like maybe send a double at Jalen Brown once in a while, but right. Right. It's maybe. not like Brown's a, a good passer. Bobby, this is a good quote. Yeah. Bobby in the chat says we need kid to stand up for players and he doesn't even do that. Yeah. You know, it's like, maybe there's, there's gotta be one of these post post game comments where if things are really sideways, him going off and getting a foul, like a fine with the refs, like something like that would be nice. I yeah, guess I mean, the free throw disparity was Celtics at 30 attempts. Mavericks at 14. So yeah, this might have been a game to do it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. By the way, Jason Tatum, 39, 11, 11 rebounds, five assists, three steals, two blocks, zero turnovers. Yep. And a did lot not of feel free throws. Like, did not feel like that like while I was watching the game. But he First was, quarter was big. He had a lot of points in the first quarter. Yeah. He defensively, he was very, I thought that he was. More well, it's so odd. So it was funny hearing harp on the, he's like, that's a six, eight, six, nine guy. He's really talented. Jason Tatum is a shade away from seven foot. He is an enormous player. Our guy, Matthew always talks about this. It's it's he's there with like KD in terms of size and you don't really see it on the floor, but you just, you got to trust me on this one. That's a big man. 
because it's, yeah. it's 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 just it's tough watching him. He is so tall, um, <laughs> and just rangy too. It's yeah. really impressive to watch him play. I don't know. Yeah. I I don't. He's not the player Luca is, but he is quite a fascinating player. I like him all the, all the same. So yeah, for sure. All right. Um, I was going to host a live show, but my wife just sent me a text and asked me to uh, to to not do one tonight because we apparently have to go do a very very early morning uh, daycare tour. Yay! Oh, that's fun. <laughs> well, you know, it's the way life goes sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, when do we play again? We have they a lot play, of games. They play against Phoenix on Wednesday, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So that's the nonsense National TV, rivalry game. ABC, yeah, ABC mm. game. So against the, the Suns, and the Suns just won on a game winner from Kevin Durant, a double clutch kind of Dirk Nowitzki esque left elbow shot, really beautiful shot. Suns are playing um, very, very well. Um, they have won. They're six in a row. Uh, so they've they've turned it around because their big their big three is finally healthy. So uh, well, if there was a stretch for them to sort of get their lives together, it would be this Phoenix, Atlanta, Sacramento, Orlando stretch. Now, none of those teams is a pushover, but they could theoretically win all four of those games. Like those are games I feel good about. Because then you play this just murderer's row where you go Minnesota, Milwaukee, Philadelphia. I mean, Joel Embiid scored 70 points tonight. Um, I can't, I am like, I, Joel Embiid gets a lot of like floppy foul calls, but he shoots like 90 plus percent from the line. He might score 80 points against the Mavericks <laughs> interior defense. And I'm just, I'm not looking forward to that. Um, so I would like for the Mavericks to, to figure something out a little bit. Yeah, they need to go two and two in these next four games, bear like minimum. Or- oh, I mean, I I think that's kind of likely though. The rest of the way they play, they're going to play five hundred basketball. I mean, there's not you, you kind of scroll through and and they don't there. There's like a post All Star break um, stretch where they're going to be playing a couple of teams that might have decided to pack it in by now. But that it's it's the Mavericks really want to make the playoffs, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be very. <sighs> there's just there's a lot there's just a lot. Hey, they still have to play Detroit twice before the season's over. So there Ooh, you go. Hey, two wins. <laughs> Though if we lose to if we lose to Detroit at that point, no, I, I don't think it's 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 I'm fine. Log off. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> I know. I know. T Bone says, "Kirk, we do need another live show." Um, my wife says, "I can't." I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> plus, like I don't know. This is I want to do one after a win. I need to get back in my groove. I need to get. This is yeah, all. People, this people might be too angry for you tonight. Yeah, this is just the. Do you think we will do a live show on Wednesday, Kirk? That game is at nine o'clock, and and so I I I would guess maybe yes, just because it's like at that point I reach a point in the evening where it's like, well, if I'm going to be up, I'm going to be up till the baby has a feed at like two or three in the morning. So <laughs> yeah, Eric says, Josh, you join the live show. Josh doesn't want to do these guys. I'm like I'm like a shitty I'm a <laughs> shitty radio DJ on these live shows. You guys you guys are the ones that help make the show, uh, buddy. If you st- <laughs> Brian says if you think we won't still be angry after a win, it's a great point. It's a great point. Harris says the game is at seven thirty. I'm a moron. All those right, a- those see- ABC Wednesday games are like. They're always 7.30. I wonder if that got bumped because our spreadsheet says 9. I wrote it down because we have this whole big organizing sheet. Oh, well, it probably did. Nobody cares about our problems. (laughs) All right. This has been Kirk Henderson and Josh Bo. Thanks so much for listening. Please remember to leave us a review. Shoot me an email. Do all that fun stuff. We'll talk to you guys on Wednesday. And go Mavs. The drama. They're having to be separated. They've both been shown the red card. The entertainment. The superstar. Oh, no, no, yes. Welcome to the Planet Premier League podcast. I'm Mark Chapman, and every week, Cesc Fabregas, Nader Manua, and myself talk all things Premier League. They have this dynamism and this quality that they can play anywhere. They need to prove themselves in scoring more and more and more goals. I think if they don't win the title this year, the season is a failure in the league. Planet Premier League. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.